Well, it's September 25th, 2024. Uh, thanks for being with us. We have many special guests with us today, but one who's with us right now, Ray. What's up, Ray? Hi, thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> yeah. We love it when you join us, Ray. I love when you invite me on. It's always fun to chat with you guys and see what's going on with our members in the Facebook group and elsewhere. We have had so much happen since you've been on. Um, and we talked a little bit about this last social hour, but we hung out in Philadelphia for our regional conference. What was the highlight for you in Philly, Ray? City is fantastic. I haven't been there in a long time, so it was great to go and see the historic sites. It was great to interact with conference attendees. That always, I think, brings a lot of energy to the staff, being able to see what they're doing, what's going on in their world, and how AAPC can support them. So that's always, any conference we have, that's always really my highlight. Yeah, yeah. And for those who don't know Ray, Ray, Chief Product Officer. Yep. And when I hear that title, it, to me, like I, I, you are kind of the, the guru. You are so tied into every aspect of coding and uh, a true subject matter expert and um, within, within the industry for us. Thanks, is that, Alex. Yeah, is that, is what, that accurate? That's what I like to contribute. Yeah, you know, looking at overall products and what our products offer and how we go about product development. Um, I think the reason why um, we have such good industry insight on what people need is because of our connection to our members and them helping us in a lot of our product development, you know, from everything that we do using their insights trying to fix their pain points uh, really helps us hopefully do a better job in what in meeting their needs. Yeah, awesome. awesome. I think your background too, Ray, just to talk, just to brag about you, I think your background gives you so much, um, gosh, it's so useful in developing products on the business end of things because you can see it from all the different angles. So. Yeah, you, we rely on you for a lot of things. I mean, you speak at HealthCon, you're, you join us for social hours, you do trainings, you do, you wear so many hats. So just wanted to give some extra recognition and praise to you because, yeah, you're awesome. And you've been like just a, a staple for this company and the industry for a long time. So, well, thank you. I appreciate that. It keeps life fun and interesting. So, hey, um, we've, we've got Myra. Um, who has joined us, Myra Simmons, yeah. and she she's always at our conferences. Love to see her. Myra, thanks for being with us today. And Dave, uh, before we went on, uh, you're back at Mount the Foothills or a base camp or Mount Shasta. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do I need to give an update? Yeah. Yeah. I'm at the I'm at base camp still. Um, it's been warm here for has it been warm everywhere? Because it's been in like the high 80s. For late September, I'm expecting snow, but there's been, you know, not even signs of that. So interesting. Weird. Yeah, with Dave's oh. travels, I've said I want like a little tracker. I want like a little map of the U.S. and like where he is going and who he's stopping to see along the way. Just all oh. of Dave's adventures. All of Dave's adventures. I love that. Yeah, maybe I'll make an interactive map somehow. That's a that's actually a really good idea. <laughs> Well, Dave, I don't know if you've ever heard this proposal by Ray, but she had thought it would be fun to get like a AAPC wrapped tour bus of sorts, and then we hit the road and hit our, our chapters across hit the Hit the road and go and go visit members where they work and go visit chapters. You know, we can do that. Where in the world is Dave Kaiser in his uh, journey across AAPC? Yeah. Actually, Alex, I talked to him about it a lot in Philadelphia, and I think he's on board. Even Dr. Church said he thought it was a great idea when we were talking to him about it. So, yes, well, yeah, everybody's very encouraging about it. And honestly, I would be all for it. I think that would be such a fun adventure. And I would yeah. love to interact. One of the, my favorite things, not only about being a part of the company, but well, about conference, all of that is just interacting with everybody, all the members. And to me, that's really what it's all about is seeing everybody just 
their lives getting better and improving. So yeah, let's do it. Hey Dave, has my life gotten better and improved since you've known me? Oh, am I am I headed got better. upward or? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, Alex. That's since you were just you know a little young whippersnapper when you started with us to now, not that you're not still young. Yeah, I've seen you grow in many many ways. Oh, good, good, good. Because if I'm not, then I I'm not hanging out with Dave enough. Oh, well, thank <laughs> you. One of the one of the uh, one of my favorite things was meeting Alex for the first time back at our. It was, I think it was our old office. It's our old yeah. office. Yeah. Well, I know we had Asian for lunch that day. I don't know. I think I might have been a Thai restaurant. Oh, was that right? Is that. that the right place? Yeah, it was some Asian something that they brought in. Yeah. yeah. But I remember Alex just being the most friendly guy and he was just, just wanted to get to know me. And, and I had been with the company already for a little while, but I was like, who is this guy? He's awesome. So, but since then, Alex, you've become you know another the two of you really like you know are the faces of aapc so it's so cool just how things have changed over the years and yeah. there are a lot of amazing people that work for aapc and i know many of our viewers who are watching um in, in, who includes jackie right now caprio she's watching she says she loves you ray uh, <laughs> i love you too <laughs> but uh our members interact with AAPC in different ways. Some of our um, members uh, are involved with local chapters heavily, and they might talk with Marty quite a bit or um, Chris Taylor with on the education side, all of that. So it's fun. We've got a great team. We do. All right. Well, today, guys, um, our, our viewers, wherever you may be, we're going to talk about code updates for 2025. Can't believe that we're almost to Q4, oh my goodness. And um, looking forward to that, but I know there, there have been articles or at least one article in health or AAPC, the magazine, I almost called that Healthcare Business Monthly, um, covering this topic. And we have webinars and workshops that um, have been rolled out to cover these um, updates to keep you guys informed. But we also have a great panel today and I'm gonna let them in right now. Yes. All right. Claire Stevenson, how's your life? It's fantastic. I just got back from vacation. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> Share more. Where did you go? Uh, we went to a wedding and then went to go see a concert in Seattle. So it was a busy nice. weekend. Who did you see? Uh, Green Day. <gasps> it was awesome. <laughs> Friends of mine saw them, I think, in Denver, and they said it was amazing. I think it was Denver. I can't it, remember. It was a fantastic show. And actually, uh, I've been trying to see them for about 12 years now, and I've been thwarted every time. But this was my third attempt. And so third time's a charm. Nice. That's awesome. Were you close enough I, to throw Billy Joe's spit on you or anything? Like no, that? unfortunately not. Unfortunately, not that close. I'm Still old. Not. I need to sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> I remember where I was when I bought Dookie. Is a blockbuster music. The yeah. album. Yeah, that was yes. your first album, right? That was the first one. It is actually the 30th anniversary of that. I'm sorry. Why? I can't believe that. <laughs> that is amazing. We actually played the entire album in it, like in its entirety for the concert. It was really cool. That's cool. Where were you when you bought the album, Alex? You said that you were talking oh, about. Oh yeah, you remember Blockbuster Music? There's Blockbuster Video, but for a split second there was Blockbuster Music. Headphones on. Yeah. Yes, you can open any CD and listen to it. That was awesome. And what's a CD now, right? <laughs> exactly. I had the tape of Dookie. Oh, do like you? That Green Day album. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, I have the tape. It's a good one. It's a good one. Heather, you have you been listening to Green Day lately? Uh, no, no, no. I've been I've been working hard. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Heather, um, how are things in your neck of the woods? They're going really well. So um getting some cool weather from some of this uh, uh the hurricanes and i guess we're going to get a little bit more but up where i'm at 
we just get the rain and some nice breezes. We don't get the the destruction that's coming through, but um, so we get to enjoy yeah. it. It's cooled off. Remind us where you're at, Heather. I'm, I'm in Kentucky, central Kentucky. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I guess that's, that's a great time to give a shout out to our um, friends in Florida. You know, stay safe. I, I hear hurricane weather is headed your direction. Um, so uh, hunker down. And uh, yeah, we just, we're thinking about you and, and hope um, this rolls through your town um, without much impact. So. Yeah, that's one thing hey, I hey. don't miss about living in Florida is the hurricanes. So yeah. Yep. Hope they're all safe. You traded hurricanes for massive, well, I don't know, massive amounts of snow, but some snow. Yeah. Well, and av uh, avalanche things too. So now my husband says we've lived under every type of weather thing that could happen, hurricanes, earthquakes, and now avalanches. So every natural there you disaster. Go. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. Was there a place well, in the US that doesn't have some sort of some sort of something right I mean, tornado you've got tornadoes earthquakes, got earthquakes on the west coast you've got yeah yep. I mean, all that i think when i was in waco texas i felt like i was in a little bit of a pocket because i was a little further away from the hurricane stuff but like a little further south from all the tornado oklahoma northern texas stuff but no earthquakes all um, right like you gotta deal with something oh, no matter where you're at. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh we we talked about Ray joining us. She's not with us often, but Claire and Heather have become regulars. I feel like you guys have been on at least a handful of times over the last few months. And um Claire, um, when she first came on, was not an APC employee, and now um here she is a part of the team and it's fun to, to have you guys um, back with us. So we're going to kick off this discussion about um, 2026 code updates. Um, Ray, are you? would you be okay with leading us in, kind of give us a little summary of how you see code updates are impacting our users, our customers and members this year? Um, so, I mean, we've got a variety of kind of themes and topics throughout the code sets that change. And I, I think what's exciting is everyone's like, what's in store for us this year and how do we get prepared for it? So there comes some excitement to see what's what's new coming up. Um, when we perform the education around code updates, it's really something that we have um, set aside webinar series for in order to handle code updates. And it's to give an overview and help members and coders, those in industry get prepared for the changes. So we have that on the schedule every single year for our webinar subscribers. And then um, depending on the volume of code updates, um, it could end up being a workshop. And every year because of the number of CPT code updates that we do, that is a workshop that we do annually. And the, I guess the say the difference between a webinar and a workshop is during the workshop, it's a longer period of time. It's interactive. We give cases so that people can apply the new codes. Um, we've done this for ICD-10 as well, but it really just depends on the number of changes. And every year we have fluctuations of sometimes we're really heavy with ICD-10, sometimes we're a little lighter, same thing with CPT. Okay, all right. And I know, um, have we had, have we presented any of our workshops or webinars yet? So for ICD-10-CM and ICD-10-PCS, yes, we've had those webinars um, in September. The CPT updates, the webinar is, uh, we always do that the week of Thanksgiving. And then the workshop will be, the CPT workshop will be the first week in December, I believe, if that date holds. So that's usually our cadence. Okay. All right. And I guess it might be best just to hop in with uh, talking a little bit about ICD-10-CM 
and what's happening on that end. And I, I have some information saying that there are 252 added codes, 36 deleted and 13 revised. Does that sound right to you guys? Ballpark? Yes. Yeah. All right. Let, let's um, let's that, talk about that, that a little a bit. Lot? I'm curious. Is that considered a lot Great for, question. for yearly updates or is that just a little bit? Yeah, I think it's probably um, kind of a little below average. Um, in my mind, it's not. And and I guess it depends on the code changes, right? So this is a lot of clarification. There's more specificity. And so you may have a parent code that breaks down into uh, multiple, uh, we could call them child codes, or it's another subdivision of it. So you're still having the same diagnosis, just more specificity of it. And I think that's a, a number of the code changes that we had this year is that breakdown. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we know when we start, uh, when we have these webinars and we watch them and we see how long they go for, right? Because some of them, I think some years they've been kind of shorter webinars and sometimes it takes up the full hour because there's so many changes. Ray, did you recently do one of those webinars? Didn't you do CM? Um, yes. No, I, I didn't do any of the ICD-10. You're usually on with me for CPT and there's some years where I can't even breathe and we're going <laughs> full steam ahead. Um, and I can talk a little bit, once we get through ICD-10, I can talk a little bit about CPT and what's coming. All right. Claire, would you like to take a, give us a little overview on how you see the updates for I-10? Um, could affect our users or what, what things you see in that code set for the new year? Sure. Um, I agree with Heather. There was just a lot of, um, there was a lot of codes that were converted to parent and child codes were added to, uh, increase specificity. Um, for example, for the lymphoma codes, um, there's now an option for in remission that wasn't there, um, for all of the lymphoma codes. Um, one that I, saw that was a little near and dear to my heart with my bariatric coding background was obesity specified by class because you just cannot get the providers to not specify it by class for you <laughs> so, um, or to say severe or morbid instead of class. Uh, so that one was a little exciting for me. Um, and yeah, and then there was also nasal valve collapse, which, uh, considering the amount of surgery that I've seen to repair, I was kind of surprised that there wasn't a specific code for it. And now there are specific codes and they specify internal versus external, static versus dynamic. So yeah, just lots of specificity added to existing codes. Sometimes we see, uh, see certain sections of ICD-10 get updated. Did we see that this year or was it just a smattering of updating here and there? I kind of feel like it was a smattering of updating. I don't think that there was one specific section that had a huge overhaul um, that I noticed. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Heather, how about yourself? Uh, any, any takeaways on I-10 CM on your end? Um, well, looking a little bit at it, you know, we, we are having some DRG changes. Of course, you know, I'm going to want to talk about inpatient. And um, and we we actually talked about this on our PCS webinar uh, because our PCS coders are likely it's going to be more uh, uh, relevant to them because they're going to be inpatient coders, right? So there's some things that are changing. Um, there were some DRG changes, and they they tend to make more sense. I think, uh, for example, like spinal fusion and went to from single to multiple. Um, but how they're going to be um, calculating what a DRG is, um, how what the reimbursement is going to be is is changing in in the in the process of changing. So it's been a couple of years, right? So we're right in the middle of it. So for those of us who are inpatient coders getting involved in that and understanding and giving feedback to CMS on these changes will be huge. Um, because right now we have we have a have the ability to be a voice. Um, and make sure these changes are being made. But uh, one of the the big things that that we talked uh, that we talked about on our presentation was the nine guiding principles for deciding new uh, DRGs. And when you read through these, it's very interesting. It's really based off of things 
our coding guidelines and how we should be coding and making sure that we're reporting appropriately so that we get reimbursed appropriately. Um, and so that it all comes hand in hand. So, I mean, we're the folks who are gonna be making this happen and we'll make or break what happens to facilities. And Heather brings up a good point because I don't think that people realize, you know, how do we, do, like, how is it decided what codes are released, right? And really industry drives that. It's a need, uh, a request from industry. So if um, you're out there and you're coding something and you're like, gosh, I don't have a specific code to represent what I'm seeing often, then get involved in the code proposal submission. You know, there's, you know, medical societies will see a need. Um, innovators and technology will see a need. So these code proposals are taken to, depending on what code set it is, either the CPT editorial panel or the cooperating parties when it comes to ICD-10. And this is all driven by code proposal. And then these organizations review those proposals and decide, you know, how, how it's going to be implemented. So it, it really is driven by what the market sees as a need. So if Dave was coding and he hits a roadblock and says, I'm, I see this issue coming up. I wish there were code for it. What would he do to, to get something like that through? It yeah, would depend on what code set it was, but there is, um, you know, when, for CPT, for example, they have um, videos, they have an application online. They they basically equip you with the tools in order to submit your code proposal. Um, so you just have to be able to describe what the need is, why you see that there is a gap and justification for why that code is needed. Now, it's always, you know, as an individual, I think it's helpful to maybe work with your medical society on what it is that you see. Um, if you are newer to this, they're more experienced at it. Um, that's why a lot of providers and their staff will work with their medical societies on some of these gaps to get them uh, remedied. So I guess like on the lymphoma side that Claire um, brought up, um, you propose that to the Lymphoma Society of America or Cancer Society of America or work with them possibly? Right, yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. And in the ICD-10 space, a lot of that is driven by if they're researching a condition, right? If you have some conditions that are going to other specified and you don't have a unique code, sometimes it makes patient outcome uh, reporting and utilization of resources for that condition, it makes it tricky when you're lumping it under something else. And that's why, as they were talking about more specificity in the code sets, allow you to be very specific in the type of diagnoses that are being treated. Okay. Heather, you brought up DRGs. So has there been an overhaul with DRGs or a significant changes? They are, they are changing, so they're going through it. So currently, the way they're going to be doing it now um, for new DRGs, when they're deciding on new DRGs, is they're actually looking at it. So in the inpatient world, we have something called CCs, which are comorbid conditions, and MCCs, which are major comorbid conditions. Basically, so then you have like, you have somebody who comes in who doesn't have anything, but maybe the condition going on. And, but then you may have somebody who comes in with this kind of middle tier and they're a little sicker, costs a little bit more. And then the MCC would be folks who are, are more, uh, more sick, most sick, right? And so depending on it. And so they're looking at DRGs now. Um, currently, we actually have those three tiers for most of, it, most of them, but they're looking at it. They may do, uh, they may split it where it's um, a, a very, uh, you know, a basically well person tier one and tier two versus a and they're together versus someone who might be that third tier and so or vice versa it may be this the sick and the sickest and the and the non-sick <laughs> the tier one being here so it's changing a little bit and we're going to see it look differently um 
but they're they're moving forward with that. And uh, what we code now affects what we get paid later. So two years. With COVID, there's a couple more years in there, but definitely makes a big difference. And I think as coders, one of the great things that we need to remember, especially with the specificity that's coming in right now with um, uh, the, these new codes is, it's not just the facilities and the research that's using it, our communities use this so that they can say, okay, we have this population of people who may have lymphoma and remission now, and they need different resources than someone who, than a, than a population who has lymphoma, active lymphoma. And so the, your community can bring in uh, resources based on those codes as well. So I think that's, that's one thing to remember. It's not, it's not just, it, it's not just getting paid. It's not just statistics on the medical side. It's actually our community that we're looking at these things for. Right. Awesome. Hey, I do see that we have a, a webinar coming up in a few weeks, how a DRG is built, a payer's perspective. And mm -hmm. I wonder if that might be something that could help prepare or give people um, foresight into what's coming. Um, it's something to look at. I don't know, Ray or Heather, if you guys know anything about that webinar. Uh, actually, Claire and I know about it, and we know the speaker oh. who's going to be talking about it. Uh, I found it intriguing. I don't know that he is going to be, it's going to be Ty Alexander. I don't know if he's going to be going into uh, future, but he talks about it from a payer standpoint. And Claire and I both had questions as coders. Well, why do you do this? Right. And why do you do that? You know, and so this is a great time to get on with a payer, listen to their mindset, and, 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 figure out how that works so that we can work through it. He, the, it there was nothing, he's doing everything appropriately and he's following the uh, internet only manuals when he's doing his job, but it's not quite the way we think when we're doing it. Right. So interesting perspective. Claire, do you got anything on that? No, I just, yeah, I definitely found it to be interesting. It's always interesting to see the payer perspective because, you know, there's, I don't want to say adversarial, but it's good to know what they're thinking. So as a coder, you can apply that knowledge and hopefully get your clean claim through with no denials. <laughs> yes. Yep. Payers are our friends. Yes, they, they are, are our yeah. friends. <laughs> they are our friends. And when you think about it, the patient's at the center of both, right? They want to serve their membership and we want to provide care for their members. So it, it should be more of a collaboration and partnership than different sides of something. Absolutely. It's great to be able to pick pick a pair's brain for sure. Uh, in the article in the September issue of Healthcare Business Monthly, I'm just verifying, yep, September issue, it, it says that there are changes to I-10 in just about every section. So if you haven't peeked into that, it's probably a good idea to um, to just get your bearings and make sure that whatever specialty you're working in that you are um, caught up. Um, let's see here, it, it, there is a point that um, there are several new codes for diseases of the muscular skeletal system and connective tissue, but in the magazine article, which is on page 36, again, of the September issue of AAPC, the magazine, um, it breaks down each chapter and what updates have been in there. And then the webinars, um, in fact, Jill Young recently presented about the ICD-10 updates. Um, you can get that on demand on our website. And I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna share that link in the chat now, along with the discount code. So if you're interested in, um, in getting a good solid overview of what's to come, um, with ICD-10 CM, you can do that. And uh, we've got uh, 25, $25 off. So I'm gonna set that up right now. And then Alex, similar to that article um, that we do for the ICD-10 updates, we also um, will release a, a summary of changes in APC the magazine for CPT updates, and that will be in the December issue. Okay. So why do they release those codes at a different time? Like we talked about before going live, that there's a different release date for HICPICS and, um, and CPT. How come there isn't one just this is what's happening on all the code sets 
don't the entities get together and collaborate? No, okay. they're they're different code sets with different with different goals. Um, the CPT release is more in line with lining up with CMS. For those of you that aren't aware, once CPT codes are created, they're valued by the RUC, and then those recommendations are given to CMS. And then for those of you that follow the proposed rule for physician services, you'll see it documented, the codes, the values that the RUC is recommending as far as RVUs go, and then what CMS is proposing to do based on those values and how they plan to factor that into the fee schedule. So the timing for CPT ha has a lot to do with the different things that have to happen once a code is created. Um, and I think it's more to do with the different entities. Um, and I'm not 100% sure, this would be a fantastic trivia question, um, but not all hospitals are on a calendar year, they're on a uh, fiscal year. So um, that's what drives the October 1st um, release, if I'm not mistaken. One of you guys can correct me, but I think that that might have something to do with it, not 100% sure. Sounds okay. accurate. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll make it a trivia question. If if someone Perfect. in the audience knows, please say if I'm right or wrong. I'd love to know. But yeah, that's that's an interesting question, Alex. Hey, we. Oh, go ahead, Heather. I was going to say, well, you know, now for CM uh, and PCS, we could have April first updates since COVID, and you know we have oh, a that's few, true. We mm -hmm. have a few coming now in April, so. If it was true, I, I don't know that it still stands true. Right. That, yeah, because they, you know, they're doing that. They have criteria for their April first, but um, uh, it has to be like COVID, where there were codes that were necessary for a huge population of people. Right. So, um, I know they have criteria for it to be changed on that. So, um, curious. I'd be curious about that too. But I think I. I do think it does have something to do with fiscal year, or did. What would the April 1st date be? Well, I mean, besides April Fool's Day, I don't know if I could trust <laughs> anything coming out on that day, but I mean, maybe they should try for the 2nd of April or right. the 31st <laughs> of hey, March. I'm going to start everything know. on the 1st of everything. <laughs> yeah. If you throw like another number in there, it's really going to just turn this industry upside down. We We can't handle that. <laughs> Right. There's always a rhyme and reason, even if it's. I think it's so that you don't have to wait a full year to get active codes to start utilizing to meet a patient need. You know what I mean? So as yeah. things go more digital, I, I think that we have the ability to get quicker at releasing codes. We we saw that in CPT with all the COVID movements that happened very quickly. Do you think so. it's that? April's just the six month after six months after October. So it's like, okay, we'll you, wait half a year. And then if there's any, anything we really need to push out, we can push it out in the April updates. Is that it? Yes. Yep. So like we know that April 1st, um, we had, there are some ICD uh, things happening and it's really just the index and the tabular. There's some misspelled words and they're actually names of diseases. So they're going to go ahead and get those fixed. So it's going to be things like that where you really kind of want it right. Um, and it needs to be right now versus later. Um, and then COVID is a great example. We had to get some codes out there so that we could track what was going on. So. Okay. Hey, before we jump into PCS, uh, we have Keisha here and she's struggling to pass her CPC exam. I'm gonna read her comment here. She says, anyone wanna tell me how to pass the CPC exam? I've done process of elimination, took it four times. She'd love to pass this thing. Uh, right, what kind of encouragement can we give uh, Kaisha? I think it depends on um, how she originally prepared. Did she take a full course? Is she trying to attempt this on her own? Is she new or is she working in the field? It depends on, on a few things. Um, I know that we have had examinees who have struggled on the exam 
find uh, success with utilizing the practice exams that we have because the questions are not the same, but they are similar. And we moved the practice exams to our new exam platform wow. so that they're taking the practice exam on the same platform as the certification exam. And that's helped people maneuver in the electronic format to be able to get used to what they're going to be taking the test on. The last thing that you want to do is log into an exam using a platform that you've used for the first time. There's also some electronic tools like the electronic notepad had um, skipping of questions to be able to come back to another one that gives you some really good practice with the with the um, technology. Um, as far as her attempts, I would I would want to look at side by side what those attempts were and where she did well and where she might still be struggling. So being able to look at that in the areas of study to understand where they need to focus their time. Um, so it, that's a big question, and I think that there's multiple factors. I don't think that there's one right answer without knowing everything that she's attempted already. Um, if you don't change your strategy and you just keep doing the same thing over and over again, just taking it again is not going to get you where you need to go. Um, and this is where, you know, getting involved with um, local chapter, getting some insights from them would be helpful because you'll be able to share more of the story other than, you know, the limited information that that we've got in that in that question, Alex. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just to reiterate what you're saying about um, practice exams, and I would not take that exam again, Keisha until you are comfortable not just passing it but understanding the concepts behind each of the question and i know if you miss a question in the practice exam um you can it gives you study tips and and helps well, you with that. And, and that's important because when you miss something, you want to go back and see why what logic what concept did i miss I can tell you that, you know, a lot of people say this and it's it's extremely important is knowing your guidelines. And when we're looking at the exam statistics by question to see how each question is performing and what people are getting wrong and why. In a lot of instances, they're overlooking an important guideline, an important parenthetical, an important sequencing rule. Um, so it's not just the code and the descriptor, but all of the information that's put out to say how to use these codes uh, properly. Yes. Claire, do you have any suggestions for Keisha? Um, my suggestion was going to be go back and take a look at what sections you struggled in and really focus in on that and also the guidelines because the guidelines are so important that's always going to be what you're falling back on to make sure that you're coding correctly. Um, and I think maybe in the testing environment, uh, when you're going through your CPC exam, maybe you're just focusing on looking up that code and putting it in. You need to stop and take a look at what the tabular instructions are telling you, look what the guidelines are telling you that are applicable to that code instead of just, just picking the code and going with it. Dave, you know our resources in and out. Do you have any any suggestions for her? Anything that we're missing? Well, the first thing that that popped up in my mind when I saw that question come in was just um, after taking it several times, I would be looking personally. What I would do, I'd be looking at the areas where I fell short. Okay, well, what are the areas where I need the most work on? And Ray already touched on this, so won't talk too much on it. But I would really dive deep on those. And then there are resources that even from the course or like Ray said, however you took. Um, or studied or prepared to take the exam. If you took one of our courses and you still ha have access to the materials or the recordings, if it was a VILT class, I would definitely go back through those things, even reaching out to um, instructors um, or a coach, if you have one or a mentor to get some extra help. And maybe they can look at some of those areas with you because um, you know, having some extra eyes might help. Hearing her question makes me think about the popular uh, definition of insanity, doing the same thing and getting the same results. So we don't want you to feel lost, um, Keisha. So um, stick with it. Check out our Facebook group that it's 
AAPC Facebook group on in Facebook. We are on Facebook. So we know you can get access to that, but that's a great place to ask questions. But I also love um, uh, the chapter meetings that um, Ray suggested. Okay, we're gonna head to PCS. Heather, that this is your this is your thing. And you recently presented on PCS, I-10 I PCS updates for 2025. Lead us into that. Okay, well, I'm gonna start and then I'm gonna let uh, Claire talk about it because she knows an awful lot of this part of it. So we actually had 371 new codes. We didn't have any revised and there was 61 deleted. So currently, well, starting in 2025, we will have 78,948 codes in PCS. So that's a lot. Um, there's a, a lot of interesting things. I guess what I would touch on is that I'm really excited to see is the uh, some of the NTAP which is just a, a, an extra payment for new technology, but there's going to be some for sickle, sickle cell anemia uh, treatments, and that's going to be huge. Um, really glad to see that uh, we're moving forward on treatments for that because it's something that really historically hasn't been uh, uh, re, you know, researched an awful lot. So seeing, seeing improvement, seeing growth in that area, that's huge. That's huge for folks that have that disease. Um, Claire? Um, yeah, so I I always think the NTAP, the new technology codes are my favorite because they're just so interesting, all the new things that are happening. Um, I helped Heather present that webinar and there was just a, a couple that stuck out to me that I thought were really cool. Um, I have some uh, orthopedic spine neurosurgery in my background and they're is a new technology code um, for fusion cages, but instead of the intervertebral um, cage, it's actually fusing the facet joints. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting to prevent the facet motion for people with facet joint uh, degeneration or facet syndrome. Um, also a new, um, a new implant uh, also for the spine that is made of a material that will not be so obstructive when they're doing MRIs to follow up on, to see how the patient is recovering from their procedure. Um, I thought that was really interesting too, is specifically um, targeted at patients who are having um, post-op infections and they need a lot of the follow-up with the MRIs and uh, the imaging and just to see past the uh, instrumentation to make sure that patient is healing effectively. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, but yeah, there's just all sorts of new uh, codes that are really interesting. about that one, Claire. Right? Just because, uh, yeah, kind of getting nerdy a little bit. Not you, <laughs> but me. No, I um, am. It's okay. <laughs> uh, it, is it a different substrate or different uh, substance that they're using? Replacing? So it is um, high strength carbon fiber reinforced peak material. So I'm not quite as so nerdy to be able to really break that down even further, but that's what it is made out of. Interesting. And so with the imaging, it allows better penetration through the device. Right. You're yeah. not going to have those artifacts in the image that are obscuring the, uh, the healing process when they're trying to see the healing process. Oh, interesting. That's really cool. So hey, you somewhere can't get away from clinical. The, that's what I get, you know, like, right, because I know people get, want to get into coding and they're like, I can't handle the clinical side, but you guys still you have to. dabbling in that. You have to, yeah. You have to, you have to understand. You can't translate something you don't understand. Um, but similar to what Claire was talking about, new technology, that's where we see um, a lot of codes being added to CPT for 2025. So new technology, um, medicine is always innovating and there's always, they're always coming out with better ways to achieve something. And that's where we see category three codes being added to CPT to capture that new technology. Um, we also see in CPT for 2025, a lot of the code changes are going to be lab and path. And a lot of that's driven by the molecular pathology, 
the genomic codes, a lot of advances in lab technologies. And it's just amazing the data that we can get from some of the tests that they're doing. Um, another thing for CPT, sorry, Alex, I jumped in on her new technology thing. So if you want to go back <laughs> to PCS, you can, but my mind just started going to where I wanted to go and didn't give you the way to transition. But anyway, <laughs> uh, other things that CPT will have in store for us is a um, new subsection for telemedicine. And we know, um, all of the benefits that we're seeing with access to patient care with telemedicine services. So we have a new series of codes for audio and visual, um, audio and visual codes for new and established patients, as well as audio only. Um, so those are kind of some of the, the three major themes that we see coming out of CPT that's going to handle the bulk of the codes that we're going to be getting in 2025. And when will we see those updates, Ray? Um, so we'll be talking about them for the first time in the webinar that we're going to have. Um, AMA has the CPT Symposium uh, in November where um, they will go over the codes from a clinical perspective as well as a coding perspective. Um, so that's when you'll start seeing education released around these code updates. And a lot of it too, you get insights from reading the proposed rule because these new codes, you don't have the number because at the time of the release of the proposed rule, CPT wasn't officially released, but you do get a sense of what the changes are that are in store for 2025 based on what CMS is planning to do from a payment perspective. Okay, I dropped a link to the CPT webinar that you're presenting um, yep. next I'll month. I'll be doing the workshop um, too. Okay, awesome. So I dropped that into the chat. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, I was just going to, I was going to comment on, um, we have all these webinars bundled together too, all the updates webinars. If you just want to buy all those as a pack, they're discounted together on uh, the website at 149. So it's a pretty great deal. If you don't have a subscription, but you really wanted the updates, webinars you can get them that way i just and get this in your promo and your promo alex was it just for one single webinar yes 25 bucks off of a single i don't so i don't know how that math works out um compared to a bundle the bundle seems like the best way to go or better Depends on subscription and then you're covered for the whole year when um i don't know if we ever do anything on the updates that happen in april but maybe if, if that's necessary, we would. I think it depends on what's coming, right? I mean, usually what will happen is depending on what's going to be released, they'll decide on if a webinar is needed. But I know at a minimum what we do is it uh, an article in APC the magazine that will be released there online. And then we update uh, Codify with the information as well. Okay. Um, awesome. I know that for the um, ICD-10 maintenance committee that just happened, meeting that just happened, we the, we actually put out a blog um, on it just to give an idea. And I did want to circle back. You said genetics. I think that's going to be a hot topic for the next couple of years. Yeah. And if you don't know it, it, this is the time to get in and start learning it while it's still really, it's really still in its infancy, even though it's been around for so, so long but we're starting to see more specific codes, procedures, both on the inpatient and outpatient side. That's a definitely a growing arena to, to keep your eye on. Yeah, that and also AI. We're seeing a lot of that on the CPT side of things. And um, in, the, in the CPT code book, there is the AI taxon taxonomy and the definitions that was created by the CPT editorial panel. Um, as these new technologies come out, understanding what's autonomous, what's assisted, these are all important things on understanding how to code something. And not only that, but how to value it, right? How, how much work is involved and um, how to properly value these codes for payment. That is so interesting. It is. <laughs> I don't want to leave out Hick Picks. Uh, we spoke a little bit about that before we went on the broadcast. I was making up um, some 
fake news on hick picks and then ray said hey we actually can talk about it a little bit because that code set usually isn't released until december november well yeah i think november. that they they ship out in december uh, yeah it depends on when they're actually released but i know at a minimum um december is when we've is the latest i think that we've had them out um, but you can also see the G codes that are being recommended for creation also in the proposed rule. Um, and it just gives some insight on some of the codes to expect. Okay. All right. And all of these code updates, we get the codes, obviously we, we get the codes and then we, we load them up into Codify pretty quick, don't we? Because like, obviously you can get those codes in Codify before the books are released? Um, I don't know. They're going to be released within Codify to start using in the effective date of that code set because you don't want you don't want people to start using them before they're effective. You know what I mean? If people like jump the gun and start submitting a code that's not going to be implemented until October 1st early, that's going to cause a claims denial. So. Okay. And then the books for the ICD-10 books anyways, they are, are they shipped out? So they- They're they shipping. Okay. So um, that's why we really encourage people to get, uh, for those that pre-ordered their books with the AEPC, for, I know that one of the promotions that we did was including the ebook um, as part of that purchase. The ebooks were allowed, we can get it out a lot faster than a print book. You know what I mean? Doing it electronically, it, it's quicker access. Wait, if you get the, the print books, you have to wait for the printing, the development of the book, and then the, the shipping of the book. So if people want early access, then we always recommend purchasing the ebooks. Um, if you still want paper books, then you'll have to wait until they can be delivered. And Claire and Heather, I'm curious, how does the webinar, is it, we'll, we'll just speak to PCS, how does that webinar um, uh, share information that we don't? Like, do you go through section by section or just highlights? Uh, would you kind of give our viewers a little insight of what the webinar would look like for a code update webinar? Well, for the PCS updates uh, in particular, um, one thing that we went through and did for the new technology was to put together a spreadsheet of the code, the new technology code, um, the lay terms of what the procedure is, as well as the manufacturer of the new technology being used. And that's super helpful to coders to be able to quickly find that information, understand what you're looking at, know that it's new technology, you need to capture it with the X code. Um, so that was something extra that we threw in with our webinar. We also added delay terms to our, um, our different uh, PCS codes. Uh, when, when Claire and I started working on this together, we thought, how can we make this a little bit more um, uh, something where it's not, you're just not looking at a table. Because if you don't understand PCS, the tables can get, uh, well, they can become cumbersome to look at. And so we've added the, the layman's term to it so that you can actually start connecting. Oh, I know what the CPT code is, or I know how my physician does this code. So this is what the table looks like on the inpatient side. Mm -hmm. So we we definitely tried to add information in there that we thought would be most useful uh, to our members and something that they could take away as a resource um, as well when they're going into next year and and starting to understand these changes and how they affect them in their in their job. So I know that's one thing that we worked on and and we'll continue to grow that. So. Awesome, awesome. And Ray, as we wrap up, um, what uh, can you give us a little insight to the CPT webinar? What's your approach sure. to teaching? So those my updates? yeah, my approach is I go through the changes in the same order as they fall within um, the code book. So it's meant to kind of follow along as you're looking at the at the book itself. Um, 
because I, I hold the role on the CPT editorial panel as coding liaison for AAPC, um, I'm able to answer questions and give insight because I've been able to hear the code proposals and questions that have come up and how we've ended up at the code and the descriptor that we're at. So that's kind of what, what I add to the education is just that firsthand experience of seeing the creation of these codes. Awesome, awesome. Hey, um, Qantas is asking the the view viewers if anybody's used Codify Qantas, you can get a free Codify trial on the website. Um, so if you just take a look over there, give it a shot, and um, no no risk on that. Dave, do you have any comments about what what is your favorite code update for twenty twenty five? Oh, for twenty twenty five. Oh man. I've just uh, just barely cracked that one open. I'm still searching for my favorite. <laughs> You're smelling the paper. I do like uh, all the I do all I do like all the new technological stuff because I think that there are some. I think that we're we need to be pushing forward into all of that, uh, probably much quicker than we have been, and solving some of these underlying conditions, not just putting band aids and you know, on. Yeah. No. Anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, pretty, pretty passionate about health in general. So I think it's cool that, um, you know, we're in an industry where we get to see kind of what's coming down the pipe and what's changing and all of that. So no, it's always interesting hearing the updates from you guys, um, you know, our experts. I'm surprised Alex, what's your favorite, Alex, what's your favorite code? My favorite code? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, I love them all so much and I don't want one to feel left <laughs> out. So I love them all, but I will say... <laughs> I, I love what Dave was saying, and it's interesting to hear AI creeping into code sets. And we had that, um, we not have, but have an AI webinar for our members that offers a CEU. That still lives on with power. There's a post in our Facebook group about that. People find that very valuable. Oh, it's not just a webinar, Alex. That's a course. So oh. it's, yeah. Okay. And it's a free to members. So if you haven't checked that out, it's Correct. on our website, go into your portal. Um, and you can message me uh, directly if you need help getting to there. But so much is changing. I love it. Um, guys, stick with me as we wrap this up. I'm just going to let everybody know if you're listening to this on the AAPC podcast, I will post links in the podcast description to the um, to the webinars, uh, the PCS webinar that Heather and Claire are presenting, Ray's webinar on CPT and the others. Um, and we hope to see you in just a few weeks. Don't hang up, um, guess I'm gonna I'm gonna release us from the Facebook world. Everybody, we will see you the second week of um, of October. See you, everybody. Bye.